This is Aldous Huxley, a man haunted by a vision of hell on earth. In your new essays, you state that these various enemies of freedom are pushing us toward a real-life, brave new world, and you say that it's awaiting us just around the corner. First of all, can you detail for us what life in this brave new world which you fear so much, or what life might be like? Well, to start with, I think this kind of the dictatorship of the future, I think will be very unlike uh, the dictatorships which we've been familiar with in the immediate past, George Orwell's 1984. But this book was written at the height of the Stalinist regime and just after the Hitler regime. And he, there he foresaw a dictatorship using entirely the methods of terror, the methods of physical violence. Now, I, I think what, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find that if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled, and this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. They will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious, making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime, but they will be happy in situations where they oughtn't to be happy. What were Hitler's methods? Hitler used terror on the one kind, brute force on the one hand, but he also used a very efficient uh, form of, uh, of propaganda, which uh, uh, he was using every modern device at that time. He didn't have TV, but he had the, the radio, which he used to the fullest extent, and was able to uh, impose his will on an immense mass of people. I mean, the Germans were a highly educated people. The point is, it seems to me, that there are, are methods at present available, methods superior in some respects to, to Hitler's method, which could be used in a bad situation. I mean, I, well, what I feel very strongly is that we mustn't be caught by surprise by our own advancing technology. This has happened again and again in history, with technology has advanced, and this changes social conditions, and suddenly people have found themselves in a situation which they didn't foresee and doing all sorts of things they didn't really want to do. is needed is money and a candidate who can be coached to look sincere. Political principles and plans for specific action have come to lose most of their importance. The personality of the candidate, the way he is projected by the advertising experts, are the things that really matter. The personality is important, but there are certainly people with an extremely amiable personality, particularly on TV, who might not necessarily be very good uh, uh, in poli poli uh, positions of political trust. Well, do you feel that men like Eisenhower, Stevenson, Nixon, with knowledge of forethought, were trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the American public? Uh, no, but they were, they were being advised by powerful um, advertising agencies who were making campaigns of a quite different kind from what had been made before. And I think we shall see probably uh, all kinds of uh, new devices uh, coming into the picture. I mean, the, for example, this thing which got a good deal of publicity last autumn, subliminal projection. But I was talking the other day to one of the people who has done most experimental work in the uh, in psychological laboratory with this, who was saying precisely this, that it is not at the moment a danger, but once you've established a principle, uh, that something works, you can be absolutely sure that the technology of it is going to improve steadily. And I mean, his view of the subject was that, uh, well, maybe they will use it to some extent in the 1960 campaign, but they will probably use it a good deal and much more effectively in the 1964 campaign, because this is the kind of 
rate at which technology advances. And we'll be persuaded to vote for a candidate that we do not know that we are being persuaded to vote exactly. for. Exactly. I mean, this is a rather alarming feature, mm. that you're being persuaded below the level of choice and reason. Each people to be on their guard against the sort of verbal booby traps into which they're always being led, uh, to, to analyze the kind of things that are said to them. You write about television commercials, not just political commercials, but television commercials as such. And how, as you put it, today's children walk around singing beer commercials and toothpaste commercials. And then you link this phenomenon in some way with the dangers of a dictatorship. Now, could you spell out the connection, or how do you feel that you have done so sufficiently? Yeah, okay, this whole question of children, I think, is a terribly important one, because the children are quite clearly much more suggestible than the average grown-up. And uh, again, I suppose that, uh, that for one reason or another, all the propaganda, you would uh, have an extraordinarily powerful force playing on these children, who after all are going to grow up and be adults quite soon. Well, as after all, they, you can read in the trade journals the most lyrical accounts of how necessary it is to get hold of the children, because then they will be loyal brand buyers later on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, again, the, you just translate this into political terms. The dictator says they will be loyal ideology buyers when they're grown up. You've even written about the use of drugs in this life? Well, now, th this is a very interesting uh, subject. I mean, uh, in this book that you mentioned, this book of mine, Brave New World, uh, I postulated a substance called Soma, which was a very versatile drug. It would uh, make people feel happy in small doses. It would uh, make them see visions in medium doses, and it would send them to sleep in large doses. Well, I don't think uh, such a drug exists now, nor do I think it will ever exist, but we do have drugs which will do some of these things, and I think it's quite on the cards that we may have drugs which will profoundly change uh, our mental states uh, without doing us any harm. I mean, this is the, the pharmacological revolution which has taken place, that we have now powerful mind-changing drugs which physiologically speaking, are almost costless. I mean, they are not like opium or like coca, uh, cocaine, which uh, do change the state of mind, but uh, leave terrible results physiologically and morally. Aldous Huxley finds himself these days in a peculiar and disturbing position. A quarter of a century after prophesying an authoritarian state in which people were reduced to ciphers. He can point at Soviet Russia and say, I told you so. The crucial question, as he sees it now, is whether the so-called free world is shortly going to give Mr. Huxley the further dubious satisfaction of saying the same thing about us. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. 